Good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see you here this morning. If you would, let's stand as we open our service with a time of prayer. We uh, thank the Lord. We've, uh, well, Christmas is not over. Some of us still have Christmas uh, uh, still to do. But I uh, came in this morning and noticed all the decorations have been put away. Uh, the new year has come. But uh, we certainly want to continue as we pray to pray for the many that have lost loved ones. We still have those that uh, call this their church home that are really uh, grieving. And we want to continue to lift them up and pray for them. Pray for the many that are still sick. Uh, understand there's still several in our uh, two county area here uh, that, that have COVID. Uh, it's still a thing. Uh, we still want to pray for those. Let's pray for um, others that you've got the list on, on the wall there and, and our prayer list is still lengthy. Many that, that need us to continue to pray for them. As we pray, pray for our church, pray for the leadership of our church, pray for those uh, um, things coming up in the new year. Uh, we've got uh, some plans in place and how we're going to reach our community. And we want to pray for that. Just pray that uh, as we enter the new year that we would be the, the church that God has called us to be representing our community. Also, I pray for the many still <coughs> affected by the storms. Um, I got up this morning and the temperature dropped to 32 and I was just so thankful for the heat. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, in our neighbors, uh, that don't have heat, still don't have their homes this morning. We want to continue to pray for them, all of those that have been afflicted by the storms. Do you have others or requests perhaps that I've not mentioned? All right, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you this Lord's Day, God, this first Sunday of a whole new year. God, we're blessed. Uh, Father, as we, we look about, we see so many that are suffering and hurting. And, and, and God, we know that uh, you uh, know everything about every circumstance. And Father, we come to you this morning just as a father, a father that loves us, a father that cares a father that sees the hurts around us. And God, we just ask on behalf of those that, uh, especially those that call this their church home and are grieving today. God, we just pray that as we uh, look to the new year, uh, God, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of change for many that we love. And God, we lift those to you today. God, we just ask for your anointing in their life. God, we ask for your guidance, your wisdom. God, we pray for the many that are sick in body. God, those that uh, are needing a touch. Father, there's those among our church that have some tests coming up this week, uh, some awaiting test results, some that have some procedures this week. God, we lift those to you. We just ask, God, that you uh, just touch. God, we know that you can speak the word and heal. We know also, God, that you work through our doctors and, and medicines, and we're thankful for uh, what we have uh, in, in this region, in this country. God, we know that that's a gift from you. And Father, however you choose, we just ask that you would just have your will in, in their lives. God, we pray for our time together today. We ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as, as the team comes to lead us in worship in just a moment. God, that we would just, just for these few moments, God, just center our minds and our thoughts heavenward towards you. Uh, God, as, as we are a blessed people, that we would be a thankful people, God, that we would just honor and, and worship you in song and, and, and sharing in just a few moments. And then, God, as we come to the time of, of sharing the word today, again, God, we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit in this place. God, that the word would, would challenge us today. God, as we look into the, the scripture, God, it, it's not just old words from years ago, but God, your word is living and alive today. And God, we just pray that you would just take that word and, and, and again, God, just transform each of us. And God, we know that you've appointed us to be here for this time. And God, we just ask that you would just continue that work in our lives. God, again, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the gift of Christ. Thank you for the gift of a, of a new day, a new year. And God, we'll just give you the honor and the glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Before we get into our... Um, uh, song service. Uh, we've finished up the month of emphasis for our international missions. Uh, we got off to a rocky start because of some technology stuff here, but we have one more video uh, that Joan wants to share with you, and then she'll bring you the update on where we are. And if you weren't able to give uh, for our emphasis, we'll, we'll ask that you would be praying for that today. So Joan, you come on up and share what God's put on your heart and share our update and then share the video with the sister. And then Joe, you come right on. Okay, our goal, we set $1,600. So far, we have reached $995. I want you to pray. If God, if your ship hadn't come in yet and it came in today, 
just ask the Lord to tell you what he wants you to give. But we are in Africa, and I want you to watch this video. And no, it's Asia, isn't it? It's Asia. Okay, we've had a time. Downloading this stuff is, she's becoming an expert at it. But it, they've changed the format. But I want you to watch this and see the the, where God is using our missionaries that we give and we send, and it's your money that you give. Every bit of it goes to our missionaries where they are. It provides them with everything to reach out to these people. So you watch this video as you see where God is working through our missionaries, through what you give to Lottie Moon. Thank you. God is using IMB Missionary's previous experience in South America to now share the gospel in South Asia. They are using their knowledge of the Spanish language to help mobilize Hispanics and Latinos to serve in South Asia. The Myers are strong advocates of the mobilization of churches from Spanish-speaking cultures. God is using short-term trips to make lasting impacts in South Asia. Pray for IMB Missionaries as they serve all across South Asia. Happy New Year. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. I know we got one birthday over here. Do we got any birthdays or anniversaries today? Start the new year out this morning by blessing that wonderful name.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This next song we're going to sing is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Thank God today. He's your Savior, that you're not in bondage no more. Amen. Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
this morning God we humble ourselves before you acknowledging that you are God Jehovah Lord you know our prayers in our heart Lord even before we mention them but God it's something about coming to you something about getting down Lord and humbling ourselves before you Lord, I thank you for each and every one, Lord, that's here this morning that makes up this service by internet or even in their presence of being here. God, we don't have to be in bondage. God, you have set us free. God, those chains that so entangle us that wants to hold us down, May we just break free of them in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for those afflicted, Lord, from the storms. God, thank you for each and every one, Lord. It's, it's helping them, Lord. God, it's something to see your people come together. Lord, help this nation, this world, come together and be the people, Lord God, that you've called us to be. God, I pray for Brother Danny, Lord, as he comes and 
brings the word to us, God. Lord, may it not fall on deaf ears today, Lord, but ears that are attentive, they will put it into action. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, book of Galatians, chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. Paul writing to the church in Galatia. We looked at Galatians 4 and 4 last week. I want to build a little bit around that today. Galatians 4. Galatians 4 and 4 talks about when the fullness of time had come. God sent Jesus to this earth. Jesus came. We talked last week about how it took God 4,000 years to send Jesus to this earth after he had first promised, after he had first indicated back in Genesis chapter 3 that he would send the Redeemer, that he would send Jesus the Messiah, that because of the fallen world that we were in, because of what Eve, because of what Adam, because of their decisions, because of what Satan had done there in the garden. And so here we come, first Sunday in January, <coughs> 2022, I had somebody share with me last week, said, think about it. It's just as far from 1980 to 2022 as it is from 1980 to 1939. Now, this person I had graduated with back in 81, and we thought, oh, that makes us old and when you think that uh, it's just as far from our graduation date to where we are here as it was from our graduation date back to 1939, that seems like a long way. Those 50 years, 40 years. But you look at that 4,000 years it took God to get everything just right. As Paul told the, the church in the region of Galatia, when the fullness of time had come. And so here we are the first Sunday of 2022 and I came into the church this morning and the decorations are gone. They were beautiful, weren't they? But they're gone. They're put away. They're boxed away. Every year, Sister Donna goes on uh, New Year's Day. She has her Christmas on New Year's Day. She wants to wait because they have the big sales in Evansville on January 1st. It's a madhouse. And this year, we were just getting ready, her planning to go for her big shopping day. And we got word they had canceled the shopping. No major sales this year because of COVID. And of course, she was all down in the mouth. You know, COVID takes everything away. Now it's taking my shopping day away. But we went anyway. And uh, there were some places that were open, but there were things that were all picked over. But one thing she had been looking for, wanting to find, that, uh, and she's this consummate shopper. She won't buy anything unless it's on sale. And so one thing she had been looking for was a, a manger to put all of the people in that we have on the mantle. So far, they've been without a home. And so last night, she came in the room and she showed me the manger that she had bought. And so I came in this morning and I was thinking on the way down, I want to use that manger this morning for an illustration. And I forgot to bring that one. So we got here and all of our stuff was put away. And so I asked Amelia, I said, do we have the empty manger somewhere? And she said, yeah, I think we do. And so we went in the green room back here and it was under boxes and boxes and boxes. But she pulled it out for me. You know, Amelia, she always has everything you need. And there's the empty manger scene. And that's what I want us to think about this morning, the empty manger scene. We think about Christmas. We look forward to Christmas, all the preparations of Christmas. And the manger is the central decoration that we put out. Because that reminds us of the gift of Jesus and how Jesus came in those humble beginnings, how God arranged all of that, that Jesus would be born. And we talked last week about Galatians 4 and 4. Paul said, when the fullness of time came, and, and we talked about how God sent Jesus. And when everything was just right, Jesus came, one of the poorest of us. And God intersected all of time. We read that passage and we think about Christmas coming and going. And we get to this point, we look forward to the new year, but you have to admit when it's all over, 
A lot of us are just tired. We've, we've gotten all of the stuff looking forward to Christmas. We've done all of the, the Christmas decorating and we've done all of the Christmas parties and we've done all of the family gatherings. And well, most of us have done all the family gatherings. We still have ours to do because kids get grown and move out and kind of stretch it out. But we come to this point of the new year and we put those things behind us. And then what? What, what now? You know, always as a pastor, as a, a preacher, you get ready for your sermons. And so you start planning and preparing and you've got Thanksgiving and you preach the messages on how we should be thankful and don't rush it up that, that we don't go from Halloween to Christmas. We, we have to have that time for our Thanksgiving and then Thanksgiving and, and we spend the series of sermons on how we should be thankful. And then right after Thanksgiving, go right into the series on Christmas, getting ready for Christmas and and man, you've got just, that, that's the best time of year because you've just got a, a pocket full of sermon material getting ready for Christmas. The greatest gift, Jesus. And Christmas comes and goes, and here you are, it's over. And now what? And we're kind of tired. We're tired because, yeah, all of the hullabaloo of Christmas has come and gone, but just face it, we're, we're kind of tired because we're tired of of two years of COVID, we're tired of every time we turn on the news or every time we hear from a friend or somebody, it's more sickness. And a lot of people are just tired because there's been a lot of death and loss. A lot of people are just grieving and hurting. And so the new year is here with all the excitement of a new beginning. And yet for many people, it's like, it's a new beginning, but it's going to be a different beginning. It's going to be a tough beginning. It's going to be a challenge. The hurt doesn't go away just because we take the calendar off the wall and we throw it in the trash. Just because we go to the bank and we get a new calendar and put a new calendar on the wall. There's still difficult days. So the new year is here. What do we do now? And I couldn't help but think as I began to think about that in the message and had thought back on last week's passage of Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. And I began to think about that empty manger. You know, we build a whole sermon series around that manger and the star. You know, I preached the message on the star, the, the wonder of the star and how the Magi had probably prepared for a couple of years because of what the Old Testament, our Old Testament, but what their prophets had said that star would indicate would happen. And so they followed that star until it, it led them over that manger. And that manger was only there because of what the prophets had said in the, our Old Testament. Their prophets had told them that this king, this baby would be born in the city of David in Bethlehem. And you remember that was because of the taxation. We talked last week in Galatians chapter 4 about how that led up to that. That 4,000 years was God's fulfillment to get everything right. God being a way maker. God made it possible that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And that could only happen because the, the Grecian world had overtaken the Macedonians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Assyrians. They had all overtaken the Jewish people. And now, now... At the time that we changed the calendar from A.D. to B.C., the Christian era, God had arranged everything, that Rome was in charge, the roads were all built, the language was all the same, and the governors were in place because God had orchestrated it all, that they would come to this end and it would be full up and the innkeeper would have to say, but I've got a stable out back. And that's where he can be born. That's where you can have your kid. That's where you can stay the night. And that's where the star ended up. And it wasn't just coincidence. It was all God's plan. And so now we come, Christmas has happened. We've seen the decorations out. And now as we begin to box everything up and put it away, the manger is empty. Now what? Where are the shepherds? Where are the magi? Where are the, the sheep? Where's the donkey? Where did they all go? And so we began to read where God had made the way 
in Galatians 4. But Paul, in the context of Paul saying that God had made a way, in the context of, of Paul telling the church in the region of Galatia that when the time was just right, God sent Jesus into this world. We read the context of what Paul is really trying to say. Paul is talking about, now I'm taking a little liberty here, but Paul is talking about now Christmas has come and gone, what now? The new year is here, what now? The, the empty manger scene, what now? Go to Galatians chapter four as you stand beginning at verse number one. I always encourage you to bring your Bibles. We, we try to put the scripture on the wall, but you never can tell when a projector is not gonna work around here. So always bring your own Bible. It's a good idea to, to bring your Bible so you can mark and you can check and you can make sure I'm telling you like it is. And in case the screen does go out, you'll have your copy there. But the context of what Paul is saying about when the time was just right, Paul says this in Galatians chapter four, beginning at verse number one. Now, I say that as long as the heir is a child. Now we think, okay, the child, baby Jesus, right? No, that's not what he's gonna talk about. He's gonna talk about you. He's gonna talk about your relationship to God. He's going to talk about your relationship compared to the picture we have of the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the New Testament. He's going to talk about before Christmas and after Christmas. Before Jesus and after Jesus. Before you meet Jesus and after you have a relationship with Jesus. What difference does Jesus make now that the manger is empty? Jesus has come and life goes on. And Paul says, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, a child, the parents are gone. He's now legally entitled as an heir. All of it is his, but he's just a child before Jesus comes. Instead, as a child, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father, until he's of legal age. In the same way, Paul says, now this is what I'm trying to tell you. In the same way, we also were children before Christ. We were enslaved under the elements of the world. But here's verse number four. But when God's time was just right, when the fulfillment came, when the completion of time came, when God's plan was fulfilled, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you were sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for this, the first Sunday of a whole new year. God, we also thank you as we look at the empty manger that while it would seem disappointing almost that it's all over, yet right after Christmas, we have the calendar to change for a new beginning, a time of resolution, a time of commitment and decision. God, I pray today that you would help us to look at the manger, to look at the decorations folded and put away and to be reminded of what the next step is what it means for us that Jesus has come, what it means for us, not just as children, but as heirs, joint heirs, joint heirs with the Son of God, children of the King of glory, the creator of the universe because of the gift of Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. C.S. Lewis, 
the theologian, the author. C.S. Lewis said that Christmas, the season of Christmas, where it occurs on the calendar, he says that's the, the central event in the history of the earth. Of all of earth's history, of all of the wars, all of the things, all of the events, all of the inventions, C.S. Lewis says Christmas, not just Christmas every year, but the gift of Jesus, God sending him into this earth and him coming into this earth. C.S. Lewis says that's the central event in the history of the earth. The, the incarnation witness to the one who is immortal, taking on human flesh and embracing mortality. And then Lewis says, in the paradox of the ages, we celebrate his birth, but not his beginning. The paradox of the ages, we celebrate the birth at Christmas. And many times because of that, because of the busyness, we overlook who he really was. John said in the beginning, when God spoke, when God's word created everything that is out of nothingness, Jesus was right there. And there was nothing created apart from him, nothing created without him. For you see, he is God in the flesh. And so when we look at the empty manger scene, when the decorations are put away, the new year is here and we're about to move forward. What do we do? Well, let our minds go back to those that came to the manger. Let's look at a couple, just a couple of groups. As we read the accounts in Matthew, we read the accounts in Luke, we read the different gospel narratives of the nativity and they had some insights about what happens after Christmas. When we look at those who would have filled that manger that we see as being an empty manger today, we, we think about the coming of Christ. And Paul, in his letter to the church in Galatia, in the region of Galatia, Paul says, you need to think about this gift of Christ, this fulfillment of time, God sending Jesus into this earth. And you need to think about it in terms of a, a child who inherits everything, but as a child, he doesn't have the rights and privileges to it. That's like you before Christ. You're an heir, but you don't know it. You have a right to it, but legally it's not yours yet. And, and you don't know that. Think about a child and how a, a child exists in that situation. It's like in the Old Testament when they were slaves. They were, they were in bondage to the law. That's what the Old Testament before Jesus was. All of the rules, all of the things that you, you had to try to do to become a Jew, to convert to Judaism, all of the, the ritual, all of the temple sacrifice, all of the things that for 4,000 years God's people had tried to do to get to God. And they tried and they tried and they tried and they never could make it. They never could make it. They just weren't good enough. The sacrificial system, the priesthood, and we have all of that Old Testament just full of all of that. And Paul says that's, that's just like a child that's an heir to it all, but he doesn't know he's an heir to it all. I had a incident here some time ago with the Amish. We were over in Southern Illinois and there's a big scrap yard. When I was a kid, that was the scrap yard. If you wanted to sell junk iron, you had to cross the river and sell it over there. And one of the Amish was looking for something that he wanted. Of course, you know, they use all old stuff. And so they go to junkyards a lot to get their old stuff. I'm like, this would drive me crazy. Just go buy something new. But that's not how they do. So we go to this junkyard, which when I was a kid, this was a big junkyard. And now you have to find this guy that's in charge of the junkyard that lives in another town, but they still have the junkyard. But it's not open. But they have all of this stuff there, and you can buy the stuff if you find the guy that takes care of the stuff. And so we go over, we make the appointment to see the guy to buy this stuff that's really old stuff, and the guy begins to tell the story of why the junkyard is there, but it's not there. The old man that owned the junkyard died. And his kids didn't get any of it. He left it to a grandchild. And the grandchild is like in the fourth grade. 
So the grandchild has all of this junkyard. He's inherited all of this stuff, which is worth a lot of money, but he's a kid. And so one day, unbeknownst to this kid that has inherited all of this stuff, his uncle, who is the dad's son, but not his father, begins to sell all the stuff. And he sells thousands and thousands of dollars of stuff. And then the guy that's the dad of the kid finds out his brother has been selling the stuff. And he says, whoa, wait a minute, that's not yours to sell. So the law comes in. And so all of this stuff is padlocked and shut down. And now there's a, a guardian placed over this through the court in a receivership, big, long legal thing, because this kid has inherited all of this, is worth a lot of money, but he's just a kid. And so he has to wait until he turns of age, legal age in Illinois, to be able to do anything with it. So it's just all sitting there. But this guardian that the courts have placed over this can sell some of it, but it all has to be documented and all this stuff and run through the courts in order to do it because this kid is not an adult yet to legally inherit all of this stuff. Well, Paul's talking about that situation, a similar situation. And he says, you're just like that. You're the kid and you've inherited all of this stuff, but you're a kid and you can't do anything with it. And so it's all like the Old Testament, all the laws and the rituals, and it's all locked up. You got it, but you're a kid. You can't inherit it yet until you turn of age or until Paul says in verse four of Galatians four, until the time is right. And the time is right when Jesus comes. And when Jesus came, all of the stuff that you had as the Old Testament depicts under the law, it was yours, but you couldn't do nothing with it until Jesus came and fulfills the inheritance. And so you look at that empty manger and it's the picture of what the manger was after Christmas. And Paul says, it's, it's not that it's an empty manger, but it's what it represents now because those that had come to that manger, like the shepherds, the shepherds were out on the hills tending their sheep. You remember the story? They were just out there doing what shepherds do and an angel came and an angel gives them the message. Now, I don't know exactly, you know, we read in Luke how it happens, you know, exactly what they thought or exactly how it happened to them. But, but it says the angel comes and the angel tells them the baby's coming, the king is coming, the redeemer's coming, the Messiah's coming, and this is where he's gonna be. And all the shepherds gathered everything up, they got all they had and they went into Bethlehem and they saw the baby Jesus. And after they saw the baby Jesus, the scriptures tell us that it changes them. It makes a difference in their life. If you look at what the scripture says, talking about those, those angels or those shepherds after they had seen Jesus, look in Luke chapter two. In Luke chapter two, it says that those angels were so changed, not just by the message of the angel, but by what they saw, what they experienced, what happened in their life when they got to that manger. In Luke chapter two at verse number 17, it says, after seeing them, after the shepherds came and after the shepherds saw, yeah, they, they saw Joseph and they saw Mary, but they saw the Christ child. They saw this, this family. They saw this gift, this redeemer, this Messiah. And after seeing them, Look at what it says. This is what Luke says. They reported the message they were told about this child. They just couldn't keep it to themselves. It changed them. They had to go and tell. You remember that, that, that song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? And it talks about the shepherds. The, the other song we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. You gotta go and tell those shepherds when they saw and they realized this is the fulfillment of all of that Old Testament, not Old Testament then, but the prophets. This is the fulfillment of all of that. And the shepherds couldn't keep it in. They couldn't contain it. They had to go tell. And you and I, do you remember when you were first saved? I don't know how many people give me this testimony. Man, as soon as I got saved, I wanted to tell somebody I wanted to go tell somebody what Jesus had done for me, what God had done for me. I was so excited to go tell, I got saved. 
And the first person you meet is saved from what? You know, don't, don't mean anything. Well, saved from what? A chance to witness, a chance to tell, a chance to share. Those shepherds, when they came to that manger, and as soon as they saw the Christ child, they left, they went back, they went where they came from, but they were changed. They had a story to tell. They had a message to share. Look at what Luke says there. Luke goes ahead to say, and they reported the message. They were told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They were excited about, he's come, the Messiah has come, the Redeemer has come. And yet Luke says, when you see that empty manger, but Mary, we talked about Mary last week. We, we referenced that song, Mary, did you know? Mary. The shepherds had to go and tell. And yet Mary, she pondered. She, she meditated on all of these things. You talk about how it changed the shepherds' lives. Think about how it changed Joseph and Mary's life, that empty Manger. The shepherds went out and told, he's come, the Messiah's come, the Redeemer's come. What the prophets have said has happened. He was under the star. He was in Bethlehem. But Mary, quiet, reflective, Mary and Joseph. God had sent the angel to Mary and said, Mary, thou highly favored God's going to visit you. God's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. You're going to have a, a child. You'll call his name Jesus, which means Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Luke doesn't go ahead to say, but we know Mary knew because Mary had that resolve. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'll raise the son of God. That empty manger, the shepherds had gone to tell Joseph and Mary Joseph and Mary had had to flee. They had had to run to another country to keep the baby alive. That It changed them. It changed the whole course of their life. There is no way that you can encounter Jesus and it not change you. It changed the shepherds to go tell. It changed Joseph and Mary to have to go and to, to keep him in safety just to raise him to those, those, that age of 30 uh, we, we talked last week about how up until 12 years old, we read about him. We read about how he, he was special. And then from 12 to 30, we, re, we, we read nothing else. But Mary was still there as his mother because we read about the first miracle that when, when he comes back on the scene and she was right there. Now, Joseph is already gone by that time. We assume Joseph has passed away. But Mary is there for that first miracle. It changes their life. And when we look at that empty Manger scene. I was thinking last night when, when Donna came in and she, she said, look what I got. I found it. I finally found it. After all these years of looking, I found it. And what she meant was I found a cheap one. You know, one I, one I didn't have to pay full price for. That's what she meant. But when I saw that thing and it was empty, and of course my brain is, do your people fit in it, you know? And so a little bit later I went in the living room. Of course we're having our Christmas today. So the decorations are all still out. Amelia hasn't visited, visited our house to put everything away and clean it all up, you know? And so I look at the manger scene and I said, where's Joseph? And she said, well, he's too tall to fit in there. So he's kind of outside. But when I looked at that thing and it was empty and I thought, you know, that's kind of like what Paul is telling us before Jesus and after Jesus. When you look at that thing and it's empty and they're all gone, it's just the empty manger. But you're reminded that it changed those shepherds. They wanted to go and tell. It changed Joseph and Mary forever. They had to flee to keep him alive. Joseph had to, to every day work to, to feed the son of God, to clothe the God of the universe. I mean, you think of all they did. To, you think of those magi that came all that distance. We talked last week about how probably by the time the magi got there, they might not have even been in the manger any longer. It may have taken them as much as two years to arrive. They would have been in some other house or something by the time they got there. But when those magi came, when those wise men came and, and they knew this is the one the prophets have told about. And they presented their gifts. But then think about how it changed those 
men's life. We read three wise men. We don't know if the number is actually three or not. And just magi wise men from the Orient. We, we read about them. We surmise a lot about them. A lot of our teaching on them is what we see kids plays, you know, at Christmas time. We, we kind of interpret a lot of that in there. Maybe the Bible doesn't say about it, but we do know one thing about them. Their lives were changed because when they came, they went to see the king of the land. They told the king, we've come to see the newborn king. And you'll remember Herod said, tell me when you find him, tell me where he is so I can come and worship too. And you know, that's not really what he wanted to do. And it changed those wise men because God warned them just like God had visited Mary, just like God had visited Joseph, just like the angel, God visited those shepherds. And God visits the wise men and says, change of plans, guys. You can't go back the way you came. You see, life's never going to be the same. You can't, can't go by your plans anymore. You've got to change the route. You've got to do things different now. It's going to shake things up. You've got to go back a different way just in order to protect him, just in order for God's plan to be fulfilled. So we see the empty manger. We think about all those characters that were in there, but they're gone now. It almost reminded me, I was, I was kind of thinking, you know, it'd almost be kind of neat if we could just keep that on the mantle empty all year. Keep it all year empty. And every time you see it, it's to remind you. It changed things. It changed world history. It changed the calendar. The, the Latin calendar of A.D., to B.C., you know, or from B.C. to A.D. It, 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 it changed everything when God intersected all of history. And now when we see that empty manger, the decorations folded and put away, we're reminded of what the gift of Jesus did. We're reminded of what the gift of Jesus does for us. It reminds us that Joseph and Mary, they had to be led by the Spirit of God in order to have that discernment, that wisdom to interpret the dream to go down into Egypt. The shepherds had to be led by the Spirit to go and tell the story. The wise men had to be led by the Spirit. When I say Spirit, I'm saying capital S-P-I-R-T. For you see, when Jesus came, Jesus lived those 33 years. And when Jesus hung on the cross, just as he was about to take the last breath, you remember what he said? It's finished. It's finished. The fulfillment of God's time, it's finished. Jesus had just prayed the night before, Father, is there any other way to let this cup pass from me? And while the scripture doesn't say it, we know by what happened, what God's response was, there isn't. It even changed Jesus. And Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And he went to that cross leaving the manger way far behind. But he hung on the cross and he said, it's finished. The plan, the gift, the fulfillment. And the same thing that led those shepherds, capital S-P-I-R-T, the same thing that led Joseph and Mary, capital S-P-I-R-T, the same thing that led those wise men, capital S-P-I-R-T. When you see the empty manger, think of the spirit. For when Jesus said it's finished, what he was saying was that part of God's plan, me, I'm going back to the father. Do you remember what he had told the disciples just the night before when he had had the, 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 the last supper with them? while he was preparing them for him dying on that cross, he said, it's necessary. I've got to go away. That's God's plan. That, that's, 
That's the fulfillment of God's time. And when Jesus said it's finished, what he meant was this part of the plan. You see, I go back to the Father and the Father sends the Spirit and the Spirit comes. And while that manger looks empty, it's because Jesus doesn't need that manger to be in anymore. He doesn't need a temple. He doesn't need a tabernacle. He doesn't need a manger because now he comes in the personage of the Spirit and he lives in here. When you encounter Jesus, when you meet Jesus, when the time is right and Jesus comes into your heart, oh, it'll change you. You'll go tell. You'll go out a different way. It'll change everything about your life because when you meet Jesus, the Spirit comes. And so while the manger looks empty, it's because the Spirit is in here. The Spirit's in here. So while we may be tired, weary, tired of all the sickness, tired of the death, tired of the hurt, we look at the new year and we're reminded God always has a new beginning. And God's new beginning is not just a, a person that can be in one place at one time. But because God is God, he comes to live in our hearts. He's with all of us. And so while we get tired, we get weary. We want to give up. We want to run away. We still remember, but the spirit is in here. So we trust God. Every time we see the empty manger scene, we remember he's not in there because he's in here. If I've encountered him, if I've met him, if I've trusted him as my savior. Now, I always have to give that caveat. I always have to give that disclaimer. If you don't know that you know that you know, if you don't know him as Savior. You see, if you haven't asked God to forgive you of your sins by the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. See, it's not automatic. We're not all going to heaven. I mean, I've talked about this before. Every time we go, go to a funeral, I mean, the, you never hear anything bad about the decedent. But I, I, I heard this week about a famous person that passed away. And my first thought is, did they know Jesus as Savior? Everybody says, oh, they're in a better place. Are they? I hope they are. I pray that somewhere, somebody in their life took the time to tell them about Jesus. I was thinking this morning about the person that told my dad about Jesus when I was 12 years old. If that person hadn't told my dad about Jesus and my dad took us to church when I was 12 years old and 12 years old, Mother's Day in 1976, when I heard the message that I needed to be saved, I went forward and I asked Jesus into my heart. You see, I still thank God for that person that told my dad. I'll never forget the conversation. I was sitting there in the living room. My dad couldn't read. And yet the preacher told my dad, Carl, I'm just going to ask you to do this. Just read the book of John. Dad didn't know if there was a God or not. He's what you call an agnostic. Didn't know if there was a God or not. And the preacher just said, Carl, I'm just going to tell you this. Just, just ask you this. Just, just for me, just read the book of John. Dad was a very proud man. He didn't say, I can't read. Fourth grade education, and I watched my dad over the next month. Dad didn't teach himself to read. The Holy Spirit helped him to read. And he read the book of John. And driving a log truck down the highway... He said, God, I don't know if you're real or not, but if you are, would you save me? And I watched a miraculous transformation in my dad's life. Many years later, I was able to stand behind the podium and preach my dad's funeral and without hesitation tell those people, I know where he is because of that conversation in our living room, because of that prayer he prayed driving a log truck down the highway. I can stand here as a minister of the gospel and I can tell you I know where my daddy is without a doubt. That empty manger transformed his life because when he said, God, I don't know if you're real or not, but if you are, would you save me? And the spirit of God moved in his heart. If you don't know that you know that you know, you couldn't make a better decision than to say, God, I don't know if you're real or not. God, I've got a lot of questions. I don't understand a lot of this Bible stuff. I don't understand a lot of this church stuff. God, a lot of this just doesn't seem real to me. But God, if you're real, God, would you save me? 
We don't have to know it all. We don't have to understand it all. The Bible says, come as a child. Just come as a child. When that preacher told my dad, Carl, I'll just make a deal with you. You just read the book of John. And after you read the book of John, if you don't believe that there's a God, I'll not bother you again. But you see what I knew was, what that preacher, what I've learned later, what that preacher was going to do during the time my dad was going to be reading the book of John. And it was a lady preacher, you know, I've told you that. I knew, I know what she did for the next several days. She prayed intently that God would help my dad to understand that the Holy Spirit would help my dad to understand. And those prayers were answered. That's just one of many I could tell you of prayers answered. Do I understand it all? I'm, I've got two master's degrees in the Bible and I don't understand it all. But I just turned 58 years old and I've seen enough in that time that if God never did another miracle, he's done enough that I believe him, that I trust him. And when I see that empty manger, I know that there's a spirit. A Holy Spirit, capital S-P-I-R-T, the third person of the Trinity of God. And just like the God that created the universe and the God that came as a baby in that manger and died on a cross and said, it's finished. That third part, that third person of the Trinity of God, the Holy Spirit. When I say, God, will you save me? God, forgive me. That spirit takes up residence in my heart. Am I perfect every day after that? No, I'm human. Will I understand it all, have all the answers? No, I never will. Because there's just so much to learn because he's God and I'm not. But I trust him. I believe him. I believe in him enough that when it comes time that I have to cross the Jordan River, that I have to die with all of the unknowns of death, I'm not afraid of it at all. Because you see, it's just a transition from this life to the next one. It's just a transition from here to his presence. I don't understand it all, but I believe him. And if you're watching by way of internet today, if you're in the room today and you don't know that you know that you know, you can't make a better decision than to say, God, I may not understand it all, but I'm gonna ask you to save me. And then you take it one day at a time, one step at a time, one decision at a time. And I've said this so many times, you probably get tired of me saying it, but it's just as simple as ABC. I admit I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I may not understand it all, but the B is I believe God, you're who you said you were. I believe Jesus came and lived and died, didn't stay dead, but rose again. And the C is I confess. I confess my need of a savior. I confess my sins and ask God to forgive me. And I don't do that through a man. I just do that in prayer between me and God. Do it right here. Do it where you are watching by way of internet. Do it driving a log truck down the road. I've seen it happen wherever you are. Just God save me. And he will. Joe, you come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Would you stand some singing, some praying? But all obeying that quiet voice of the Holy Spirit that's urging you, whatever he's asking you to do right now, if it's to come forward, if it's to take somebody by the hand, if it's to, to ask somebody sitting there on the couch beside you, would you pray with me? Obey what the Holy Spirit asks you to do right now. As we sing, only trust him.
to thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your attention. Those that are watching by way of internet, we appreciate you watching. The words of that song, only trust him. You don't have to add anything else to that. Only trust him. And the next line, he will save you. He will save you now. I'd like to see altars full every time we're here. I pray everybody is saved and they know that they know that they know that they're saved. But I know that sometimes life happens. We get saved, we're saved. But you see, if the devil can't keep us from getting saved, the next best tool the devil has in his toolbox is to keep us ineffective to keep us from trusting to keep us doubting and that's why I say if you don't know that you know that you know I don't know how to explain that oh sometimes I doubt if I'm pleasing God I doubt if I'm doing what God wants me to do I doubt if I'm in God's will but I never doubt that if I died right now that I'd be in God's presence. Now, I don't know what that's going to be like. I, I've got my ideas. I think I know what it's going to be like. I think I know what heaven's going to be like, but then Paul, you know, tells us that, you know, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. We can't, it hadn't entered into our imagination what it's going to be like. I mean, I understand that. But I have no doubt. While I may be displeasing to him sometimes, I have no doubt that he saved me. And that's why I say, know that you know that you know. And so if you don't, I encourage you just to keep praying that through. Only trust him. God, I don't know. So God, save me. God, resave me. I want to rededicate. Whatever term you want to use. You don't have to get saved and lost and saved and lost. That's not what I'm saying. But just pray for that, that blessed assurance that you know, that you know, that you know that you'll spend eternity in heaven with God. Time is short. Eternity is real. Hell is hot. I mean, I know some, you know, there's no hell, there's no hell. The Bible says there is. Jesus said there was. Heaven is forever. The Bible says it is. Make sure you know. If you ever need to call me, reach out. I'll do whatever to try to sit and talk and help pray. I know anybody in this building would. Pray for one another. Paul tells us that we're to pray for the household of faith. When you come into church, you see smiling faces, you see people with their Sunday best on, you don't know what they're going through. I can tell you of a surety, there are people in this building that look like they've got it all together, but they're hurting. They're burdened. They've got cares. They've got concerns. And they need all of you to be praying for them. But then I don't know who that is. Pray for one another. You just pray for the church. See, that's why I don't like it when you guys don't sit in the same place because when I pray, I usually pray for where you're sitting. And if you move around, you may get missed but you just pray for the household of faith. Pray for those in the church. And when you do that, remember there are some that may be carrying a burden that you don't know, but it may be your prayer that gets them through that week. So you be faithful to pray for one another. That's what Paul tells us to do. That's part of what church is. Every time I hear somebody say they, they don't like the church, they don't need the church, that just, and not because I'm a preacher. I'm just like, well, if you've ever been a part of a good pray in church, you'd want to be a part of a church. I mean, if you've ever been a part of a good pray in church, something goes wrong in your life, first thing you do is you say, get the church to pray. Get the church to pray. I don't have time to tell you, just call the church. I don't know how many times I get calls like that. I can't go into it, tell the church to pray. And I know when I send those texts out, 
You guys may not stop what you're doing, pull over to the side of the road. You, you may not do that, but I know whatever you're doing, in the middle of doing that, you're praying, God help. That's why we need the church. That's why the Bible tells us, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And then it goes ahead to say, even more so as you see the day approaching, as time gets to a close, as we're about to wrap this thing up called earth, even the more so you're going to need the church. I praise God for this church. I praise God for a praying church, a loving church. Praise God for you. And that's the pep talk. David, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Jesus.